Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, church. So I know you might have some questions. You should see the other guy. But really, I was telling Rana this morning, I said the official story is there was a burning building and there were 17 babies and puppies. I managed to save them all, but then I had to leap out of a window. So that's the official story. The unofficial is I might have had an incident with a motorized scooter. So be careful about that. But um, God is good. Could have been a lot worse. And so if you have your Bibles, we're going to be back in Galatians this morning. Back in Galatians we're going to be picking up the end of chapter 3 and continuing on through chapter 4. Just a couple of things that I want to mention and we'll mention again. And as you heard in Vance's prayer, today is a day where we do want to honor Andrew and the Yakel family for um, all of their ministry here. So right after our service this morning, you can go out into the Welcome Center There'll be punch, cookies, things like that. And just make sure if you have cards, other things like that, just let Andrew and the Yakels know um, how much our church loves them and how appreciative we are of uh, the service that they have given for over a decade. So definitely want you to be aware of that. Also at the um, end of our second service at noon, we are having our March business meeting. And this is an important meeting because we're voting on the bylaws. It's no, not a major change, but we're clarifying language to ensure that we can have, you know, remote voting. So language is a little vague. You know, we've been voting via Zoom uh, throughout the pandemic and other things like that. But we want to just make sure we clarify that language so that we are above board. So we'd love for you to come at noon and be, be a part of our business meeting um, together. And so... We got to worship the Lord through song. We're going to take the Lord's Supper at the end of our service, worship Him that way. Another way that we worship the Lord is through the giving of our tithes and our offerings. So if you have, um, you'll notice there are different boxes as you exit the sanctuary this morning. You can drop off your tithe or offering in one of those boxes. If you're joining us online, we're glad that you are joining us, but you can... Um, Go ahead and you can give through our app or through our website, or you can mail in um, your tither offering. So, so glad that you're able to come and worship with us this morning as we just get to gather together as the body of Christ. So, Galatians, we're going to finish up chapter 3. If you remember two weeks ago, as we're looking at, as we're walking through Galatians together, we started talking about how Galatians is all about there's freedom in Christ. And freedom in Christ is a wonderful thing. And we talked about what is the point and purpose of the law then? If the law doesn't save us, what's the point of the law? And Paul is saying, well, he gives us the law first to tell us that we can never measure up to God's goodness for us. The law acts as a little bit of a guard of a sense because we've been enslaved by sin and shows us we can never measure up. But then once we're saved, what's the point of the law? Well, then Paul says the law is also like a teacher okay, that shows us how we can best follow the Lord and live for him. And so as we looked at that, the point and the purpose of the law, we're going to transition um, here to the end of chapter 3 and on into chapter 4. And really what happens is the first two chapters of Galatians, as Paul is preaching and teaching us, he's sharing all about how we have freedom in Christ. But then he transitions really, and in chapter 3 and following, he starts saying, this is how you live as a spirit-filled believer. This is how you live. This is how your mindset changes. This is then how you walk with the Lord, how we walk in light instead of in darkness. And so with all of that being said, um, my friend Jim Tippy is going to be reading for us from the end of chapter 3 through part of chapter 4. We're so thankful for Jim and what God has done in and through him. So if you would please just stand in honor of the reading of God's Word, uh, end, of, end of chapter 3 and following. 
because neither Jew or Greek, slave or flea, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. What I am saying is that as long as the heir is a child, he is no different from a slave. Although he owns the whole estate, he is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also, when you are children, you are in slavery under the basic principles of the world. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem them under the law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit that calls out, Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave, but a son. Since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. God, we love you. We are so thankful that we can be your children. We can be your heirs because of what your son Jesus did for us. We pray, God, that you would just bless the time that we get to spend in your word. We're thankful that your son Jesus is enough. And we're thankful for the adoption we have into your family because of what he did for us. So God, we pray that you'd be with us for the next few moments, Lord, that you would turn our minds' attention and our hearts' affection to you and to your word. God, we ask that your spirit would move. We love you, Lord. It's in your son's name we pray. And all God's people said? Amen. So, he starts off, Paul, Paul begins by explaining how we are heirs through Christ. How we're heirs through Christ. And in fact, at the very end of, of chapter 3 and verse 26, it says, For through faith you are all sons of God in Christ Jesus. It says, through faith... We become sons, we become children of God, we become heirs through Christ. And there's something pretty remarkable about that. Now, maybe you can remember this, this theme of adoption is one that, that shows up repeatedly in the New Testament. In fact, last year, maybe you remember as we were reading through the entire New Testament together, Paul really goes into the idea of adoption in the book of Romans as well. And a little over a year ago, I showed you a video. I have one of my best friends, one of my roommates from college, who he and his wife are in the process of, ad of adoption from Thailand. So his little girl, who was three at the time, or four, was writing a letter to her soon-to-be brother or sister. Well, last July, my friend Tyler, his wife Erin, they were matched with a little boy in Thailand. He was 10 months old at the time. His name is going to be Dax. So they're matched with this little boy, Dax, with Thailand. So they now know they have a son in Thailand, but with the pandemic, with government bureaucracy, they have been waiting since last July for a phone call to head to Thailand so they might go and pick up their son. So as of even this morning, right now, they're still waiting on that phone call. So it's approaching, you know, what, what is that, nine months, something like that. And so they're really hoping this, this little boy will turn two in September. And so they're praying that before he turns two that they can get over to Thailand and be able to get this child who is theirs, who is their son. And so while they know that he is theirs, they still have to go through all of these steps and go through this adoption process. And there's financial things. There's these payments that happen. There's all of these things that have to happen in order for them to get their son. And the pandemic has slowed everything down. So it's just a waiting game. In fact, I had a few of my good buddies come in to St. Louis this past week for spring break. And he was supposed to come. But he's like, I can't use any vacation time because I want to be able to go as soon as we hear from the Thai government that we get the okay. And so it's this frustrating time of waiting for him. He has a son. He knows that son is going to be his, but he's not, he's there, but he's not really officially a part of their family yet, if that makes sense. 
And so what we see here as we look at this idea of sons and heirs, what we have to understand is really we get this picture, and first we get this picture of we're reaching up to God. We're reaching up to God. Because when Paul in verse 26 says that we, through faith, you're all sons of God in Christ Jesus, this is really revolutionary language. It's revolutionary language. Now, you can go to some translations and they want to be more inclusive, so they change that to instead of saying that we are sons of God in Christ Jesus, they actually say that we are children of God in Christ Jesus. But when you go back to the original Greek, Paul says sons, and he says sons for a specific reason. Here, in the Roman culture, unfortunately, if you were a daughter, you, you weren't an heir, right? It was sons who were heirs. So when, when Paul is saying all of you become sons of God, he's saying all of you become heirs with Christ, that you are open to the same type of blessing that Jesus as the Son of God has. So Paul uses that language. It's incredibly important. So we are sons of the creator through faith. In fact, it continues on. And look what he says in verses 27 and following. For those of you who are baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ. So we've been baptized into Christ and we've been clothed with Christ. Well, what does that mean? It means that through Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, he conquered the grave and he made that payment for sin. It allows us to enter into God's family. The Bible tells us that we are bought with a price, that we have been redeemed. Just like my friend Tyler and his wife Erin have had to pay all this money to the Thai government and to these agencies and this and that in order to make sure that they're able to get their son in the same way Jesus purchased us, redeemed us with his blood. It says now we're clothed in Christ. When God looks at us, he no longer sees our sin or even our Attempts of good deeds. The Bible says that any of our righteousness is like filthy rags, right? It said he sees Christ. I remember when I was graduating from seminary, um, the, the seminary had this program. They wanted to make sure that spouses of graduates had nice clothing so that when you would go in view of a call, you know, you wear a suit and all those other things, they wanted spouses to be able to have a nice dress to wear. And so Jill gets this invitation, and these, these uh, women, were, they said, hey, your husband's graduating. We want to take you and all these other um, graduate wives out. We're going to take you to the mall. We're going to take you shopping. We're going to get your nails done. We're going to get you jewelry. We're going to buy you a nice dinner. And Jill was just like, free clothes, I'm in. <laughs> and I was like, I don't have to pay for the clothes, I'm in, you know? And so she went. And all of that was purchased by someone else. And then she had this brand new dress, all these brand new things, all purchased by someone else. She was clothed in that. And what Paul tells us is that because Christ paid the penalty for our sins on the cross, that now we are clothed in his Righteous is now we're able to reach up to God. We are sons, we are children, we are heirs through Christ and his sacrifice. And then he continues on. He says, There's no Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, since you are all one in Christ Jesus. And so the other thing is we see really what, what Christ sacrificed us for is that it not only helps us reach up to connect with the Lord, it also helps us reach out. It helps us reach out. And it helps us reach out because what we see here very clearly is that cultural, class, and gender barriers are gone. So often it's easy for us to compare our lives to others. 
We have the tendency, seems like we can look at people that have more, no matter how much you have, and think, if I just had a little bit more like them, like, man, life would be so much better. God is saying those class barriers are destroyed. It's not about comparing yourself to anyone else anymore. Comparison can steal our joy. Instead, he's saying that those, those class barriers have been just decimated by the cross. It says there's no Jew or Greek anymore. It's not about your ethnicity that's going to save you. It's about your faith in Christ. When he says slave or free, again, this is really that whole cultural class barrier. Now, when we understand slavery in the Roman uh, in Roman civilization, it's a lot different than the chattel slavery that we think about in America. Well, what would happen is even to people, if they were in debt, they might, they might sell themselves into slavery to someone to help pay off that debt. And he's saying, no, there's no slave or free any longer. A large portion of, you know, that Roman Empire was actually people who were in bondage. And Paul says that disappears because of the crack because of the cross. Then he continues on. He says, there's no male or female. Now, let's be clear. Let's not take this out of context. This doesn't mean that, you know, gender doesn't matter, okay, or that you can choose your gender. Okay, that's not what this is saying. But it's saying that God doesn't categorize us this way. It's not like the Roman Empire, You'd have more rights if you were male. He's saying he looks at you and he simply says, I don't care about your race. I don't care about your class. I don't care about your gender. I care, are you clothed with Christ or not? All those barriers are gone. The only thing separating us from the cross is whether or not we repent of our sin and trust in Christ's finished work. Then he continues on right there, and then verse 28 says, and if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. So he's saying that he's now reaching back, we're reaching all the way back to Genesis. And Genesis 12 and 15, when God called Abraham out, And he tells Abraham that you are going to be blessed, and through you all the nations of earth will be blessed. Genesis 15, he makes a covenant with Abraham. And what he's saying is, we are Abraham's seed, and all that God has promised we will enjoy as adopted children. All that... God has promised we will enjoy as adopted children. And he's going to tell us more about the work of the Son as he continues into chapter 4. More about the work of the Son. How the Son really plays a vital role for us. So you continue on, verse 1 and following. He says, now I say that as long as the heir is a child, he, is no, he differs in no way from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. Instead, he is under guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So he's saying, this is, what, this is what's helpful. In the Roman world, you were treated like a slave until you were 14. You didn't have any property rights or anything like that. And even then... After 14, where you kind of were coming of age to a point, you still had overseers that worked with you and helped advise you until you were 25 years old. And so when he's talking about the work of the son, one thing he's saying is the son makes us come of age. The son makes us come of age. The son allows us to step in and have the full benefits of being the, an heir with him to Christ. It says in the same way, verse 3, we also, when we were children, were in slavery under the elements of the world. When the time came to completion, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law. To redeem those 
under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. So what we see is that he redeems us by paying our price in full. The picture that Paul gives us here, again, we have to understand slavery in the Roman uh, Empire was a little bit different, but the picture is that of a slave market where a master would have to go and pay the full price to purchase this slave. And God, through the blood of Jesus, buys our freedom. He buys our freedom. And not only that, but what does it say? He says, to redeem those under the law. Why? So that we might receive adoption as sons. He gives us the full rights of sons. And again, ancient Rome, if you were a wealthy man, you had no heirs, what you would do is you'd go and you'd look at a slave who'd been close to you. And then what this master would do is he would make that slave his son under the law. And he would give that slave his entire inheritance. And so what we see is that God does that with you and with me. And we might be these slaves to sin. Christ redeems us. Then God says, I am going to make you a co-heir with Christ. And all the benefits that he has, you are going to get as well. Isn't that unbelievably remarkable? Christ removes the curse that we deserved, and then he gives us the blessing that he deserved. This great exchange. And God gives us full rights as sons, as his children, because of the work of Jesus on the cross. Then he continues on to kind of tell us what the Spirit does in all of this. Verse 6 and following, it says, And because you are sons, God sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave but a son, and if a son, then God has made you an heir. God has made you an heir. So Tim Keller puts it this way. I love how he describes it. He says, the work of the son brings an objective legal experience. It's an objective legal experience. There's been this exchange that has happened. He has redeemed us from under law. He has paid the penalty for our salvation with his blood. His blood purchased our freedom and allows us to be co-heirs with him to the Lord. That is remarkable. It's an objective legal experience. It's been paid in full. But the Spirit, it's not just an objective legal experience. The Spirit brings us a radically subjective experience, a radically subjective experience. So when you've trusted in Christ, repented of your sins, you are saved and you are redeemed and you are saved once and for all. It's called the doctrine of eternal security. We don't ever have to worry about losing our salvation because Jesus paid the price for us and we're so thankful for that. But then what Paul's transitioning to show us is, hey, after you've been redeemed by Christ, then you let the Spirit come in and live in and through you, and you have a radically different subjective experience in life when you allow the Spirit to lead through you. And in fact, he gives us this first example. He says, because you are sons, God sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So let's step back for a second. Paul is writing to Galatians in modern-day Turkey. And yet right here in the middle of Galatians 4, he uses an Aramaic term, Abba. Why does Paul use this Aramaic term if he's writing to Galatians who don't speak this language at all? 
We know this harkens back to Mark 14. And I'll turn there. You don't have to, but as Jesus is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, just listen to his prayer. It says in verse 35, following, he went a little farther, fell to the ground, and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. Listen to what Jesus said. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Jesus, in a moment of incredible anguish, we know that he is hurting so bad in the garden garden that he's literally sweating drops of blood, right? And he cries out, Abba, Father. He's crying out, Daddy, please. Get this picture. I have a three-year-old, right? And I think with my daughter, man, and she just cries out, Daddy, especially when she's like in pain or anguish, and she cries out, Daddy. And what do you think I want to do? I want to go and just wrap her up in my arms. And he's telling us that's the type of relationship that we have with our heavenly father. God is not this angry, mean old man who's up there ready to just bring hellfire down on you. He says he's, he's went at it and he poured out all of his wrath on his son, Jesus. Now you have the ability to call out, Abba, Father. Daddy, come to me, and God wants to lovingly embrace you in his arms. What we see here is a picture of an incredibly intimate relationship that God wants to have with you, and he wants to have with me, with all of his children. He says, I want a deep intimate, close, personal relationship with you. I don't want you just to believe with your head what my son Jesus did. I want your heart to be transformed. Where you love me deeply, where you cry out to me in help, when you need help, when you simply say, God, I need you. The Spirit works that at any point in time we'd set aside our pride and just cry out to the Lord. God desires that intimacy with us. He desires to give us comfort and protection and provision and He wants to lead and guide you. He says, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then God has made you an heir. So if we want to get really practical for a few moments, really practical, let's talk about two specific steps to have a deeper experience of sonship. Two specific steps to have a deeper experience of sonship. The first thing is that we ask the Spirit to illuminate us as we study the work of the Son. We ask the Spirit to illuminate us as we study the work of the Son. So what we'll get to do at the conclusion of this service is we're going to take the Lord's Supper together where we reflect on and remember and worship our God who loved us so much he sent his Son to die on the cross for our sins. And so what we need to do is we need to reflect on the gospel all the time. The gospel doesn't just save us and we forget it, but we need to reflect on it each and every day. We need the gospel every day. We need God speaking into our hearts every day. And so we ask just the Spirit to illuminate us as we study what the Son did, as we study God's Word, as we ask God to give us direction in how we can best live for Him. 
want the Spirit to lead us each and every day. You know, when we get into the idea of repentance, metanoia, it's actually this word of like a change of mind. So we ask the Spirit to come in and to change our minds so we can repent of any worldly or fleshly thoughts that we might have. We might live according to God's Word. All right, we're transformed, Paul tells us in Romans, by the renewing of our mind. So we no longer live for the world. We no longer live for our flesh, but we live for the Lord. And so we need that Holy Spirit change us. We know that this word is different than any other book, right? Because we know God tells us it's living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. And so we ask the Spirit to be at work supernaturally as we study His word, as we get to know Him. The other thing, really practically for us to do, that Paul tells us, is he literally says, because your sons... God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Crying out, Abba, Father. The other thing I think that we need to do, we're, we're pretty good at trying to live our lives our own way and thinking, I don't need to be dependent on the Lord. And so you need to cry out to God and address the issues of life. By remembering his love. Cry out to God, address the issues of life by remembering his love. So you want to look at everything that you're walking through, the prism of God's incredible love for you, and then you cry out to him and you lean into him and you trust in him through everything that you're doing. But it's this utter dependence on him. So as you just look at your own life, just ask yourself as you reflect on your life, Are you someone, when you mess up, are you afraid of who God is? Or are you a child who is assured of his Father's love? Are you afraid to go to God? Are you a child assured of his love? I can remember when Isaiah was about three years old. Everybody says terrible twos. I say, no, it's always three for me. I remember I was was at the office, okay, and... um, Man, we lived at the time, we lived, in a, we lived in a parsonage. It was like across a field from the church. I remember Jill gives me a call. She's like, Zach, you need to come talk to your son right now. I was like, well, I know I've got a you know, long journey back home, but I'll do it. What had happened is he was throwing a fit for something. And as he was throwing a fit, he threw his head back. He ended up nailing Jill in the lip, and Jill had busted her lip. And so, you know, I, I went home, and... You know, I'm trying to make it very clear, three years old, right? But it's like, that is my wife. And you never, ever touch my wife like that, right? You never touch your mommy. And there were a little bit of tears. I was like, that's a good thing, right? Be a little scared. But I still remember what he said to this day. He goes, Daddy, do you not want me to be your son anymore? And then I break, right, you know? And I was like, nope, of course not. Buddy, like, there is going to be discipline when you mess up. And understand all this, right? The Bible's very clear. God disciplines those that he loves. I was like, no, buddy, I love you so much. You are my son. I would never, ever not want you to be my son. I love you. Now, I want you to repent. I want you to treat my wife, your mom, with respect and with love. You need to think about what you're doing, not throw these ridiculous fits. But, buddy, I would never not want you as my son. That's ludicrous. And I'm a very, very sinful, earthly father. That's why Jesus says, if you, as sinful fathers, know how to give your children good gifts... How much more so does our eternal Father know how to give good gifts to us, to those who ask of them? So as you're sitting out there this morning, just ask yourself, how are you looking to God? Do you see him as a good father? Do you see him as someone that you will cry out to, cry out, Abba? Do you trust him that he wants what is best for you? 
This is incredible, revolutionary language that Paul is sharing with us. The idea that we can be adopted into God's family, that we can be co-heirs with Christ, that though our sin put him on the cross, he not only goes to the cross and pays for our sin, but then he gives us his righteousness, that we might be clothed in it so that when God looks at us, he doesn't see a sinner. He sees a son. He sees a child. Paul says it. You're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, God has made you an heir. We are promised eternal life with the creator of the entire world because he loved us so much, he sent his son to die in our place and to pay the penalty for our sins. So I want to challenge you this morning. If you've never done that, if you never cried out to God, Abba, Father, this morning I want to challenge you. Cry out to him. Confess of your sin. The Bible says if we just simply confess with our mouth, believe in our heart that God... Uh, confess with our mouth that uh, Jesus has died for our sins, believe in our heart that God raised from the dead, then we will be saved. Confess, repent, believe, and then we become children of God. Isn't that amazing? Let's cry out to God this morning. Let's go to him in prayer. God, we love you. God, we're so thankful for your word. God, we pray right now, Lord, if there's anyone in this room, if there's anyone watching online that hasn't yet made that decision to trust in you, God, I pray that right now they'd cry out to you. God, that we would be seen as your sons, your daughters, your heirs. God, I pray if there's anyone in this room that is afraid to come to you. Maybe they know they've been saved, but they just got this idea they can't come to you, that you won't accept them, that you're not a loving father. God, I pray that you would just soften their hearts right now. Lord, that your spirit would be at work in hearts, even as we pray. So God, we pray that you'd be with us this morning. We love you, Lord. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.